Hey guys, so if you know me, you know I'm someone who really, really loves comic book movies, and I would defend almost any of them, with a few exceptions. And one of those exceptions would definitely be the 2016 Suicide Squad. So I'm happy to say, I don't know if there's ever been, if you want to call this a sequel, I don't know if there's ever been a movie or sequel that's just been as big of an improvement upon the original as as this movie is because wow i cannot remember the last time i had this much fun with a movie getting james gunn to direct this movie was just so perfect because the first one already kind of seemed like some wannabe guardians of the galaxy so now we got that but we also got it r-rated and uh we also just have an all-around i would say stronger cast i think they kept most of the standouts from the first movie mainly being margot robbie and Viola Davis, and even uh, Joel Kinnaman I wasn't a huge fan of in the first movie, but in this movie he returns as Rick Flagg, and this time I love him. We also get Captain Boomerang returning. We'll get to him in a sec. It actually surprised me how, how similar the plot is to the first movie, but somehow it's way better. And it did a lot of the things that the first movie did that I thought were part of the issues with it, where the Suicide Squad is sent on a big mission to, like, fight like a world ending threat that I thought fit the Justice League more yet somehow James Gunn makes it work and it really just shows how just the execution can just make or break a movie the team we're introduced to at first when you find out is only part of it's not quite everyone we can see that we've seen the trailers we find out later on this is the A team when they're sent out to Corto Maltese the island where the whole movie takes place we're following the A team as I mentioned uh yeah we that they get rid of uh, Captain Boomerang right off the bat. And I didn't mind that at all, because uh, I was not a big fan. Like like I said, the first movie, really the only saving grace for me was, like, Harley Quinn. Actually, the first one to go is Weasel. And uh, that, that was a bit of a bummer, but at the same time, the moment is played so well that it's, it's, it's just immediately, like, you just know right off the bat, okay, this movie knows how to, like, just nail the humor and all of like these great comedic moments because James Gunn is so good at this kind of thing. So it really just feels like Guardians of the Galaxy, but for <laughs> for adults only. Once we're kind of done with the A team, then we're introduced to the B team, who is ultimately minus with the uh, with the added bonuses of Harley and Rick Flag. This is basically the actual squad we'll be following, and that includes Bloodsport. Ratcatcher 2, Peacemaker, King Shark, and of course, Polka Dot Man. But then it kind of rewinds after we're introduced to the B team. It rewinds to three days earlier and shows how all of both teams, basically, especially um, Idris Elba's Bloodsport, though, got uh, recruited. And so this sort of introduces kind of how the movie is going to be told. And there's a lot of a lot of text on the screen in kind of creative ways and it felt very well the combination of this and just the violence and language and stuff it really did i've heard other people say this but i'm gonna echo it it really did remind me of not just james gunn of course because it's him but tarantino it really felt like quentin tarantino almost could have directed this movie the crazy thing is blood sport idris elba's character is He's really, like, just so much like Deadshot, not just even, like, his skill set, but even the the kind of plot he has and kind of his motivation is his daughter. Ratcatcher, too. I loved her introduction as uh, Amanda Waller's coming by. She's, like, basically, like, I think the actress is in her 20s or so, but, but the way she acts is basically like a teenager, and it just made me laugh so hard, and she was just, like, sleeping when they find her, and Amanda Waller's, like... Ratcatcher 2, you're up, and then she's like, oh no, I don't function well in the morning. And I love Amanda Waller's response at first. She plays along and is like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, then, and then Amanda Waller is just like, move your ass. <laughs> that was just hilarious. And then we're introduced to Sebastian, who's on her shoulder, her, her main kind of alpha rat. And uh, 
This is just where you can see like no one else could have quite, even as I mentioned, it's kind of Tarantino-ish, but really no one else could have pulled off this kind of balance in this movie like James Gunn. Because you just, you feel, despite all the R-rated blood and everything, you feel that just like kind of absolute like cuteness and heart that Guardians of the Galaxy had. And, uh, Sebastian the Rat, even though he doesn't talk or anything like Rock and Groot in Guardians of the Galaxy, he is just as adorable. Just like Guardians of the Galaxy, just a really killer soundtrack. After they have the thinker though, before they can break in to Jotunheim, Brick Flag reminds them, okay, wait, we actually, we gotta go get Harley though first. She was captured by the dictator guy. Before we saw, we've seen a lot of bits of this in the trailer, but uh, before they end up going there to save her, Harley, after uh, resisting a lot of torture and stuff, actually manages to break free herself. And then we get just an amazingly, amazingly shot, amazingly accompanied by an awesome song and everything sequence that's just so James Gunn. Harley just going through all these guys and slaughtering them, breaking free. So I just thought this sequence was so cool because just that by by even having her sing that song before, then we know this is probably how she was seeing things the whole time to some extent. As like we start seeing all bonkers kind of, we get like some traditional Disney, classical Disney looking animation of birds flying around and it's almost like a video game. And when she sees, she does get this javelin from one of the other squad members that dies early on. That's sort of a running thing throughout the movie. And we see it like highlighted when she breaks free. And so it's almost like she sees life as like this zany, bonkers, messed up video game. So it was just really cool how we get into Harley's insane head in this movie, in that sequence especially. Then uh, Harley, as she's leaving uh, the place she was being held, then she sees Rick Flag and Idris Elba and, oh, Bloodsport, I guess. Um, are there to save her and uh she kind of sneaks up on them and then they're like we saw us in the trailer they're like oh what what are you doing here and it's like oh she's like well what are you doing here and they're like well we're here to save, save you and it's just uh yeah really uh kind of hilarious moment even though it was in the trailer so pretty much from here on out then they uh basically tell uh once they free harley they tell the thinker how things are gonna go down like a slow motion shot you get when the whole squad's kind of assembled and they're heading to jodenheim is just some really like just amazing like just it's just a one of the, it's just such a visually stunning expertly crafted movie and so much that goes without being said in this movie it wouldn't work as well if we didn't have some of these character relationships already established like like harley quinn and rick flag knowing each other just just even like those little looks you can see how long of a, how much, how far their kind of relationship has come from the first movie where he's just kind of annoyed by her. And uh, now they seem like partners in crime. And now he's kind of, he, he really likes, he likes the Suicide Squad now. In the first movie, he was just kind of a stick in the mud trying to keep them in check. But now he, he likes them, especially Harley, I guess, because she's probably one of the only ones that survived since that first movie. And as we get into Jodenheim... The squad begins to sort of split up. So a lot of the squad is fending off the enemy forces. And a couple of them, Brick Flag and Ratcatcher 2, they're led down by the Thinker as the other members hold off, I guess, incoming enemy forces. They're led by the Thinker to basically show them Project Starfish. They find uh, just all sorts of people like zombies basically with with these starfish over their faces we see what they look like without the starfish on and it's like their face is ripped off so they are they're dead under there the stars the only thing kind of animating their body at this point and making them talk then we see the actual main starro controlling all of them behind glass and uh yeah he's huge we do get a big reveal though uh the thinker reveals that this wasn't actually just uh, this was actually all orchestrated by the American government. And really what Amanda Waller was ultimately saying on there for was to not really destroy Starro per se, but to destroy all connections the, um, and records of the American government being behind these horrible experiments that they've been conducting in Corto Maltese. So Rick Flag pretty much 
Oh, and before before this, I believe, uh, yeah, Peacemaker comes down. He kind of he's, he was meant to stay up uh, with the other rest of the squad on their side of things, but he comes down and because he said he doesn't trust the thinker, but quickly we were, once once the reveal is made about the American government being behind things, then we realize that's why he was actually there. And he was specifically the only one, I guess, who was in on the loop about this. Amanda Waller told him and that he needs to make sure the records of this are destroyed. But Rick Flagg, being actually cool and an honorable person, which yeah, I almost feel bad for not liking him more in the first one now because I really liked him in this one. He says he's going to show it to the world and Peacemaker, knowing specifically that they're really there to destroy that, is like, oh, I can't let you do that. What's going on with the rest of the squad with Bloodsport and Harley and Polka Dot Man? They, they get into some mischief and the whole kind of structure they're under is starting to collapse and this sort of lines up when Rick Flagg and Peacemaker come into conflict. Yeah, eventually, I kind of saw this going into the movie, but it didn't change the effectiveness of it. Peacemaker takes like a shard of broken uh, building, I guess, and he stabs it into Rick Flagg's heart. And it's a really sad, brutal moment. And then after Rick Flagg dies, we see that... Uh, Leo, Ratcatcher 2, has seen all of this, and she has the drive right by her, and it's just, a, I love, this was a great moment, just seeing, kind of, these, like, kind of, I don't know, this is, what, like, what movies are all about, I think, just characters coming into conflict and leading to these, like, just unspoken moments of tension, where you're just like, oh, shit, what now? Because you both, you know immediately what's on both characters' minds, and, uh, yeah, he's saying, Peacekeeper's saying, like, a, hey, uh, hand over the drive Cleo and she grabs it and runs and, and then he's after her and uh, he has her at gunpoint eventually and then we cut to like eight minutes earlier because as I said before the movie's always doing this thing with text popping up and kind of jumping around not being told totally linearly which is again why it feels very Tarantino-ish and we see what's going on with the rest of the squad and King Shark's making friends with all these uh, other <laughs> sea creature experiment things which turn out to be kind of vicious and then polka dot man ends up accidentally blowing up <laughs> the building basically all the squads just hanging on to survive and blood sports being like dropped down and then we go back to peacemaker with uh cleo or rat catcher 2 at gunpoint at first it almost seems like it really i think it intentionally sets it up to the way it cuts to this it makes it seem like how Bloodsport keeps falling down and down the building, that he's going to fall on Peacemaker, and that's how he's going to save Cleo unintentionally. But I think what we get is ultimately more satisfying. He, like, falls across from them and sees that... Uh, and throughout the movie, Bloodsport and Cleo have had this, like, connection. You know, they both say, okay, we're going to get each other out alive, basically. And you know, it kind of, it's kind of setting you up to think why well, at least one of them is going to die. But, um... So then we, and there's been this whole running kind of thing on who, uh, who's the better shooter because they have, have almost the same skill sets, Peacemaker and Bloodsport. And then we get an epic slow motion thing where they shoot at each other. And despite Peacemaker saying he had smaller bullets, which is why it could be more accurate than Bloodsport, we see when they actually shoot and the bullets come into clash. Bloodsport has the much smaller bullets and it goes right through and destroys Peacemaker's bullet and gets him right in the neck and... And he's dead, or so we think. A great moment leading into the Starro battle. They're about to just leave the city because Amanda Waller is saying, well, if they've destroyed the drive, then we can leave the city to die. It'll actually be better for us if, if, if they're disposed of. And then the squad is just like, uh, -uh we're not doing that. And Amanda Waller loses her shit. And we can see finally the growing tension between her and her employees back at uh, Argus they just knock her out when she's about to blow all of them up for a band going off mission and uh that was a really satisfying moment and then we get the final battle with Starro and uh I mean despite being kind of I guess thematically dissonant from a lot of these deeper themes the movie seems to have going on I just love this final battle and I think it was I don't know I mean if it's James Gunn I think it, 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 they hired James Gunn to make this an r red Guardians of the Galaxy, and that's what he does. Because both Guardians of the Galaxies have pretty huge, bombastic finales. And I would say that's actually, in some ways, the weak points of both Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Whereas in this one, 
though I wouldn't necessarily say it's the best of the movie, I would say I like this third act better than both Guardians of the Galaxies. I wasn't, I didn't feel as much like, I don't know, I felt it was more exciting. Maybe it was the R rating, I'm not sure. And just because it was really just, this movie is more bonkers and more strange than Guardians of the Galaxy even. So I loved seeing how they were all kind of played their part in taking down Starro and throughout the movie there's a running gag of polka dot man seeing his mom everywhere and she did experiments on him that's how he got his powers so so he just has to picture people as his mom then it's easy to kill them and uh so he does that with Starro and you get some pretty unsettling images of his giant mom as Starro basically and then he does play his part in taking Starro down but then he is the only one le left of like the squad at this point in the final battle with Starro that doesn't make it he gets stomped on by Starro Ultimately, though, when the, everything seems lost and seems like they're overrun with the Starro minions, we get the great payoff with Cleo Ratcatcher, who, again, the more I think about it, might have just been my favorite character. I don't know. She really is the heart of the movie, along with Bloodsport, I guess. But, um, yeah, I love just the moment she has where she's like, when the star was like, the city is mine. And then she's like, this city isn't yours. The city isn't ours. The city is theirs. And then she holds up the thing that attracts all the rats and they just come pouring in, which I could buy because this is like some really like poor kind of slummy city, right? So there's rats everywhere. Um, and they just come in and they pretty much destroy Starro. But to really finish him off, Harley Quinn, who's had this javelin, she didn't know what to do with the whole movie is like, oh, I know what this is for now. And she <laughs> runs at Starro from up high on a building and goes right into his eye and it just pierces like nothing. And it's all just like liquid in there. And then the rats come pouring in through the hole she made. So it's just satisfying the way all the pieces come together. Uh, I guess, yeah, and Bloodsport also has had this thing about rats the whole movie and just seeing him uh, finally coming around to, to, to Sebastian. Uh, Cleo's rat who's who's really loved him the whole movie and is offering him like peace offerings the whole movie it's like it's amazing when he's offering him like a leaf and Idris Elba or Bloodsport's like why the fuck would I want a leaf I just that was amazing yeah we got just despite all the blood and gore we get this really like kind of heartfelt kind of ending where they're all the survivors are flying off and it's like okay well the day's work's done and, and then we get two after credit scenes and both after credit scenes I like but both of them are literally just saying first one's like hey so this character's actually not dead the second one's like, hey, so this character is actually not dead either. And the first one being Weasel, who we find out actually survived. Uh, then at the end, we see <laughs> probably the member of the squad. I don't know about you. Probably the one that we we're that died that we were most hoping stayed dead. And that was Peacemaker. And suddenly I realized, oh, okay, right, there's going to be a Peacemaker HBO Max show. So I guess this is setting that up. Yeah, all in all, this movie is just such a blast. And, uh... Yeah, it's just one I don't think I'll get really tired of rewatching. So I give The Suicide Squad a 9 because it is just a bloody good time. Thanks so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. Take care. Bye.